It's time for the Hockey Writers Grind Line. A weekly show covering everything Detroit Red Wings. Brought to you by our own iconic top line of Wings writers. Sit back and enjoy the grind. Welcome to the Hockey Writers Grind Line. I am your host, Patrick Brown. Joining me as always is my line mate, Devin Little. And sad to say, Kyle Knott is temporary out with an undisclosed upper body injury. But fortunately, we do think he's been spared from the long-term injured reserve. Here in his place is not only our producer, not only our prospect extraordinaire and Vancouver Canucks beat writer, but the hockey writer's media editor, Matthew Zator. Matthew, thank you for joining. How are you doing today? Doing good. Happy to be back on the show. It's, uh, it was fun the first time, so uh, happy to be back. Uh, thrilled to have you on. Really appreciate you jumping on. And well, you're you're stuck editing this after the fact as well. So um, <laughs> anything that happens, you can blame yourself this week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we are going to dive right in. We've got quite a bit of ground to cover. And Devin, I have to say, we just missed our breaking news on the show yeah, by the yeah. matter by a matter of a few <laughs> hours. Um, for those of you watching, I'm sure you're well aware at this point, the Red Wings re-signed Philip Peronik, um, a, a big deal we've been speculating about what that would be for a little while now got him on a three-year deal uh, average annual value of 4.4 million dollars somebody predicted that i'm not sure who but we'll it was to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey i'm no prashant okay that's all i can say um but felt good to get it right anyways Peronic, three years, 4.4 AAV. Devin, I want to start with you. What do you think about this deal? Because the last time we talked, you thought Eisenman might go a little bit longer. Yeah, uh, not necessarily surprised that it didn't end up being a long-term deal. I, I kind of just thought that uh, it wouldn't have surprised me if, uh, if he did go long-term. But what this does is it kind of uh, puts the Red Wings onto a certain timeline going forward uh, with Verona, Heronic now, and then Rasmussen, those are the three guys you have signed beyond uh, 2023, and that's it. Uh, so you're basically looking at that timeline as uh, waiting for, or when you're going to see what the actual core of this team is moving forward. Um, so the team's got two or three years, or the players have two or three years to really uh, cement their place with the Red Wings going forward. And uh, Heronic um, is definitely in that, that same group. Um, 4.4. Kudos to you, Pat. Uh, I, <laughs> I can't believe you got it. Uh, exactly. You deserve it. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, good, good payday for him because uh, I, 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 I don't think it's an overpay because uh, mm-hmm. he's averaged just a hair under half a point uh, a game in his time with Detroit. And this team, in case you haven't realized, doesn't have a lot of offense. So for a defenseman to produce like that, that's worthy of some money. And I also don't think that it necessarily was like a cheap deal. I think Hronik got his payday. Sure. So all around, I think uh, both Eisenman and the Red Wings and Hronik should be uh, pretty pleased with this deal. Absolutely. And, and Matthew, before we go to you, I just, I feel obligated to say, remember, and I said this on Twitter, even a broken clock is right <laughs> twice a day. Right. So I don't take myself too seriously. It was a shot in the dark. It was cool to get it right, but I, I'm not exactly ready to claim my status as GM just yet. Um, Matthew, your thoughts, especially from your perspective, um, you know, covering the Canucks and from the outside looking in, what do you think about this deal that Eisenman cut with uh, Heronic? I mean, like Devin said, I mean, Heronic's uh when you look at the other defensemen that are around his price range, it's about the same. I mean, he's not, uh, you know, on a team that needs offense from the defense, he does provide a bit of that and he's young still. So, I mean, you look, you look at the Mm -hmm. deal from that perspective, I think it actually comes in, it comes in pretty well. So I think uh, Eisman did well getting him signed on not a ridiculously long deal as well. So he's not, you're not caught under a contract for a long period of time. Yep. If he doesn't progress, I mean, it, four years is not horrible. So I, I think it it came in at a pretty good deal from three years, three years, or three years. years. So. Yeah. yeah, so less, less, yeah. right? Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> it's uh, I thought mixed up the four in the four million, but yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, three years. So yeah, yeah, it's not then it's even better. So yeah, yep. yeah, and. 
to, to that point, and Devin, we talked about it I, last week or two weeks ago or whenever it was. I I thought three years, I actually thought two years, but I mean, three years is right on the money. It kind of puts it out to, I mean, remember Mantha got four and that was yep. the longest uh, we've seen and Mantha got four. Uh, we all agreed for now. This basically sets the standard for what defensemen are going to make on the Red Wings for a little yep. while until his contract is up. And that was the biggest reason why I didn't think they were going to go long term, because by the next time he's up for it, he's not going to be the guy. All due respect, Philip. He's not going to be the guy. So um, it'll be interesting to see. I think it's a great deal. Uh, to your point, Devin, I think it's fair for both parties. It's great to have him locked up and get him a lot of empty nets to shoot at from the other end of the ice yeah. because, <laughs> um, because he'll be burying those pucks. So good for stuff. Sure. We are happy to have Ronick locked down for three years, a big part of the team and hopefully a big part of the team's plans for the future. And um, congrats because we're, we're happy to see that. So, all right. That was a little impromptu because that news just broke a couple hours before us taping. Um, what we really want to talk about the first half of this show is the goaltending. We've got a lot of ground to cover when we talk about what does the Red Wing situation look like in net this year. And we want to start with the incumbent, our good friend Thomas Grice, talking about last season first. What do you think he did well? What do you think he did poorly? Uh, just to remind everybody at home, uh, uh, 9.912 save percentage, which was 33rd in the league, 2.7 goals against. 42nd in the league. Um, for those who care, track this type of thing, 5.6 goalie point share, which was 18th in the league. And that was over 34 games. Basically, while not eye-popping, uh, and I'll share my opinion a little bit, but while not eye-popping, Grice was consistent, steady, and did enough for the Wings to steal a few games and improve as a team last season. So, Devin, I want to start with you. Your, um, your evaluation of Grice last season, and how do you think that will translate to the upcoming year? I think, <laughs> excuse me, I think that Grice had kind of a tale of two seasons last year. Uh, the first half, especially the first quarter, mm -hmm. uh, it really seemed like he was still uh, getting to know his new team and figuring out how we, uh, what he had to deal with, essentially. And uh, there was that long stretch where he couldn't buy a win no matter yep. what he did. Um, and I think that was not so much on him as it was the team in front of him. Um, now, mind you, he did have some stinkers in there, but um I don't really uh, think that's why he couldn't buy a win. Um, but then after uh, kind of the first half of the season, things kind of really started to turn around for him. And by season's end, he was, he was the player of the week for like yeah. the second to last week of the season. Um, and he had like two shutouts in a row. Mm -hmm. um, only goaltender out of the two to play big time for the Detroit, for the Red Wings um, to get a shutout, mind you, let, let alone two. Um, so what I'm expecting for going into this coming season is for him to build off of that strong second half. Sure. Um, he, there's no, like he's getting used to his new team anymore. He, he knows what he's dealing with at this point. He should, uh, he should be able to come in, uh, give them solid goaltending more often than not. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not expecting him to carry the lion's load of, of starts. Uh, and we'll talk about why shortly, uh, but I am expecting him to still see the crease a fair amount. Um, and obviously you'd like to see him, um, like I said, build on the uh, success that he had late last season. Are you building up for a Calvin Pickard starting? Is that what we're going at, Devin? I guess we'll see. Stay Hot tuned. Come <laughs> <laughs> um, Matthew, your thoughts on Thomas Grice's performance last year, what he means to this team, and what would you expect to see out of him on the Red Wings this upcoming season? Well, I mean, like Devin said, he had a ridiculously good second half of the season. Um, last 12 games, 6-1-4, one, 1. 1.67 goals against average, 9-4-5 nice. save percentage. I mean, that's out of this world numbers. Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, any go a lot of goaltenders go on those runs. For sure. Um, I mean, the worst goaltenders can go on those runs. But uh, Grice is not a bad goaltender. Yeah. You're looking at his past. I mean, you see his, in the, on the Islanders, he was one of their better – goaltenders for a while it's not like he's a rookie he's a veteran uh, goaltender as well so I mean he has a lot of a lot of good things going for him and going into this season he's not going to have to play a lot um he did have Bernier last year but you know behind who we're going to be talking about next um <laughs> behind him he's going to be a great a great mentor for for Nadelkovich 
Um, he's not going to play a, a ton of games. I think he looked a bit tired um, playing sure. a lot of games because of, you know, Bernie being injured. Yep. So, I mean, I think that's probably why he had parts of his season where he didn't look very good. And like Devin said, he was getting used to a, a new system um, on the Islanders, very defensive system and going to a team that has, that gives up a lot more chances. I think he just looked overmatched sometimes, but when you now he would be able to play less and I think he'll be a, a very good backup uh, sure. or a one, a one, a one B type thing. Yeah, totally agree. You know, last season, what was frustrating in my eyes is Grice and Bernier when Bernier was healthy, just seemed to have it going at different points in the year. Uh, yeah. It would have been nice if they would have put it together at the same time. It would have yeah. been nice to see that type of tandem, but don't, doesn't every team pretty much say that unless you have a bona fide <laughs> starter. So, um, you know, you can't always have the Hashik Osgood tandem. Um, but, uh, you know, Matthew, you said exactly what my thoughts are is if nothing else, Bryce at 35, I believe, um, he is going to be a mentor to Nadalkovich, who we will talk about next. That's what I expect out of him next year. Nadalkovich is coming into a situation that is going to be challenging because he's a good goalie, great goalie maybe even, but not going to be on a great team, but he was. So there's going to be an adjustment period there, and he's going to have to learn to have that short memory, and Grice can help him do that for sure. He's been through it. He's been on bad teams. My expectations for Thomas Grice next year, though – carrying over his second half would be great. My expectations are he helps mentor Nadalkovic into the goalie that he can be, that we know he can be in the goalie that he was for Carolina last year. So um, I hope he takes that type of role. That's how I feel about it. Um, I think you guys offered some really good perspective as well. And I think we're all kind of chomping at the bit. In fact, I think it might be telling that half of my explanation right now was about Ndelkovic. <laughs> As I was talking, I was like, I am talking way too much about Ndelkovic. <laughs> Sorry, Thomas. So let's talk about Ned, if you will. Um, a lot of excitement around this kid, and for good reason. Last season, a 9-3-2 save percentage, which was sixth overall in the league in 23 games. Um, 1.9 GAA, 5.5 uh, point share which was 21st in the league. And again, that was in 23 games. And lest we forget, he finished third in Calder Trophy voting uh, for Rookie of the Year. So uh, all in all, just an unbelievable season. Very, very promising. And a lot of excitement heading into his debut in Detroit this season. So Devin, I want to start with you. Your thoughts on Ned, what you expect to see out of him this year, um, and anything that you're concerned about? Uh you know, to kind of piggyback off what you just said. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about goaltending in Detroit right now, you're probably talking about Nadelkovich Mm -hmm. and for good reason. Um, I I'm pretty sure I said this on a, on a prior show, but the Red Wings haven't had a young goaltender show up on the scene and like had fans get super excited since Peter Mrazek showed up Mm -hmm. and, uh, Ned could very well be worth the hype. Uh, it, it is, it is hard for goaltenders of all positions to be a finalist for the Calder trophy and for him to have finished third and be a finalist for that trophy speaks volumes. And he did that while backstopping Carolina, which yes, very good team. Uh, they had high expectations. Nadelkovich very much, very, very much could have gone into that situation and tanked Carolina's season because he wasn't ready but he didn't. He was one of, if not the best goaltenders Mm -hmm. in the league while he played. Um, The big cause for concern, as far as I'm concerned, is his lack of playing time at the NHL level. He's only got 29 games, um, and that is definitely not enough to uh, base a, um, or get a good grip on what what he is at the NHL level. Now, that being said, he should get a good amount of starts this season. And by season's end, I think we should start to have a way better idea of what kind of goaltender Nadelkovich is at the NHL level. Um, I would say if he starts off a little slow, um, ease off. Don't, don't hit the panic button yet. Like we just said, Grice started off a little slow uh, yeah. last season, and then he picked it up once he uh, got comfortable and hit a stride. The Delkovich could very well be in the same situation, and he's young. That can happen with that just, just off, based off of that. Um, but what you want to see him do um, is 
get better as the season goes along and be able to carry the lion's share of the starts. I'm not expecting him to start 65 games next season, but the higher or the closer to 50 and above he can get, the more confident you've got to feel that Nedeljkovic is going to be the Red Wings goaltender of the present. Sure. I all really, really good points. Um, well said, Devin, Matthew, your thoughts on the Delkovic heading into this year. Um, and from a Canucks perspective, are you jealous or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this one, first thing, this guy's the real deal. I mean, he's, I've been following him in Carolina. I did a goaltenders uh, depth piece on the Carolina hurricanes. It was last year. And I, I call him the goaltender of the future. This guy's going to be a star. And uh, he's shown it. Um, some of his, like when NHL.com can put out a top 10 uh, best saves um, for a guy that just played 29 games, I'm going to say that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of goaltenders don't get that treatment. Um, you know, top 10 saves, and you're looking at all those 10 saves, and they're all ridiculously highlight reel. Of course, they're on a highlight reel. <laughs> saves. So, I mean, his athleticism is insane. His glove hand, uh, how many great glove saves he's yeah. made. Oh, yeah. um, he's just, he, he brings that presence, I think, in the net that an elite goaltender hat needs. And he seems to have a bit of swagger to him, too. So, I mean, yes, he's played 29 games, but that those 29 games were amazing. So, um, looking at some weaknesses of him, there's not much you can say right now that are a weakness. The lack of playing time, um, he was backstopping a pretty good team in Carolina. Uh, coming to Detroit, he's going to have to face a lot more yep. and high danger chances. Um, so, I mean, he's going to be in, a we- in back of a weaker team. Uh, we'll see if he has to stand on his head a bit more mm-hmm. uh, with Detroit. So, yeah, we'll see. I think early on, yeah, you do have to temper the expectations. You can't be like, oh, he's not making those, those saves that he made in Carolina. Well, you know, give up. Um, he's going to be an amazing goaltender and, uh, Detroit sticks with him. He's, uh, they're going to be set. See, I, I choose to look at it as he'll have many more opportunities to make highlight reel saves. Yes. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Devin, you, you've got your hand up. I, Devin. Yes. I just want to throw out one more thing, uh, before it slips my mind. Uh, one other thing he probably has going for him is he's going to have a bit of a chip on his shoulder because Carolina gave up on him. Yeah. And yeah. I guarantee you, he's going to want to show them that they should have stuck with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And Matthew, I want to put you on the spot real quick. So you said, you know, you've been following Ned for a while. I am curious what in your opinion sets him apart from other young goaltenders. Why are you so confident that he's the real deal? I, I just, I, the first goaltender that came to mind with him is Roberto Luongo and okay. just watching his, the way he plays um, those great saves that he makes. It's just, it, he just screams that type of goaltender to me. I've seen like, well, Luongo was in Vancouver for a while and it just kind of reminds me of that type of goaltender. Yep. Um, you know, maybe it's because athleticism, maybe it's because he's not in position. And sometimes it's like when you see those highlight rail saves, is it that, he had to make those saves because he wasn't in position to make them easy. Like Carey price. Sure. You know, like price makes them look easy because he's always there. Right. Um, right. He doesn't have to make those ridiculous saves because he's not our position. But um, that yeah. being said, I think, you know, I, I love watching goaltenders make those types of saves. So I think, I think there's, I don't like watching Carey price because of that. Yeah. It looks like it's just, you know, <laughs> He makes it look boring. Yeah, he's, it looks like it's very boring. Like it. He's so See, good that it's you boring. should you <laughs> should you should come watch my softball game sometime because in left in left field every catch is a diving catch just because of how horribly I track fly balls. So. <laughs> Sounds fun. I I make the catches for what it's worth. It's that's, just that's always what matters. fully extended. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for playing along, Matthew. You know, for those of you watching at home, um, Matthew is the who's who of prospects and he's watched these kids come up. His opinion holds so much weight um, that hearing you say he's the real deal. Well, I don't think there's anything left for me to say about it, to be honest. So um, really, really good perspective um, for both of you. Appreciate it. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I am excited to see them play so 
We actually do have one more topic before we pay some bills. Um, the best of the rest, right? What happens if somebody gets hurt? So I joked earlier, but Calvin Pickard is the obvious um, heir, heir to the backup throne, if you will. But Matthew, especially having you on, um, I'll be interested to hear your thoughts, too, on who do the Red Wings have to call upon? Or is there anybody else in the system right now, not named Sebastian Cosa, that <laughs> you should be keeping your eye on? And Matthew, given your expertise, I think I want to start with you this time. Well, I mean, you mentioned uh, Pickard. Uh, he's no, he's no prospect anymore. Yeah. Um, he used to be a goaltender of the future with the Avalanche way back when. Um, he hasn't had a goal against average of under three uh, since 2016, and that was with the Avalanche. <laughs> oh, so, that's I mean, brutal. That is a it's, brutal statistic. It's, <laughs> it's horrible. I didn't want to like bring it up too much. <laughs> I made a note of it because they're – they, he'd be the first one they'd call upon. I mean, they're not yeah. going to. Oh, up, for sure. For sure. You know? I, but I mean, they do have, they don't. And the thing is the Red Wings, that's why they needed to draft a goaltender. Yeah. Um, Cause really they do have some goaltenders in the system, but nothing that screams, you know, a guy that's going to come up mm -hmm. and, uh, and make a difference. I mean, the is going to be here for a while, I think. Um, but then you got Sebastian Costa coming and, um, I think guys like in the minors that uh, I wrote down Caden Fult, I don't know if I say his name wrong, Caden Fulcher. Um, he had a pretty good season last year in Grand Rapids, didn't play a lot, but he did have a little a 905 save percentage and he hadn't had anything like that in the OHL before. So um, that may be some cause for, you know, celebration maybe that he, he could be a guy that could do some stuff. Um, but uh, again, I, I don't think the, Red Wings have that much really coming really fast. Sure. Uh, Kosa is probably the next best and he's still a few years away. Um, but I mean, that's why they needed a goaltender. Yeah. That's why Eisenman got Nadelkovich. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, Devin, you are going to be spending a fair amount of time uh, with the Griffins this year. So curious to hear your perspective as well on the Red Wings pipeline. Who's going to have to step up if somebody gets injured. Um, what do you think about all that? The short answer is Calvin Pickard. Right. The long answer is that uh, you hope that injuries don't happen right away. And that if an injury were to happen, you hope that it happens mid season or further beyond after some other goalies maybe have gotten, uh, gotten into their groove. Uh, I know Victor Bratstrom is supposed to uh, join the uh, Griffins this season. Um, I know our friend Rachel has her eyes on him specifically. I believe he's 24 years old, uh, drafted a while ago um, by the Red Wings. I don't remember which draft specifically. Um, but he's somebody that if he shows up and uh, shows up to Grand Rapids and plays well, I would not be surprised if maybe he gets a look. Um, I'm not you know, going to bet the house on it or anything, but he's, he's somebody that I would say keep an eye on. Um, he played really well over in Finland the past couple of seasons. Um, so if he can translate that at the AHL level, maybe he gets that look at the NHL level. But um, as things sit right now, uh, Pickard is easily goalie number three. And then there's a big old gap between <laughs> three and four. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and really to Matthew's point, that number three isn't anything to be terribly excited yeah. about. All due respect, Calvin, because you put me in there and, you know, there's going to be 20 goals a game, probably more than that. So they, they we signed... mean nothing by it, but when you look at the NHL caliber goal you're looking for, he doesn't really fit the bill. Yeah, they, they signed him to play with Grand, Rap play with yep. Grand Rapids, not Detroit. Yeah, absolutely. So um, all really good stuff. Appreciate the perspective. Thanks for all the goalie banter. It got got to love it. Tony would have loved uh, to have been on this episode, I'm sure, but um, in any case, good stuff. Let's pay some bills. Take a quick time out. Thank you for watching our show. Give us a like subscribe to the hockey writers channel. There is so much good stuff on here. We have Blackhawks banter, saber scoop, uh, chicks and sticks, and just so many other shows you need to subscribe and check out. Follow us on Twitter, sign up for our morning skate newsletter. We'll give you the best news delivered to you. We're on Spotify. We're on iHeartRadio. We'll go, we will build a pyramid and write in hieroglyphics if that's how you want us to get you your hockey news. I'm taking lessons right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, emojis are the modern day hieroglyphics, yes, yes, right? Yeah, so there we go. Yeah. But but I digress. Comment, 
like, share. We love engaging with you in the comments. You're about to see. It just seems to be getting more and more every week. And whether you agree with us or disagree with us, we couldn't love it anymore. Thank you for taking time to watch our little old show. So there we go. Our bills are paid. We live to see another week. Um, and let's talk about those comments because we have gotten to the point where we basically have to dedicate the entire back half of the show um, <laughs> to our comments, which nothing it, makes me it. happier. <laughs> so let's jump in. Lord Venom, a.k.a. Rick, asks, to what point, and I'm paraphrasing here because it was a, a well thought out longer comment, but to what point do you credit Blashill's coaching if the team does improve this season? And a wonderful hypothetical that I love. Would Tampa, if you put Blasio with Tampa, would they have had the same success as they had with Cooper? That is a brutally awesome oh, question. And I'm sure Devin is dreading leading off, which is why we're going to you first, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, gotta, gotta drink some water first because I'm going to be talking. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's start with the back half of this question. Uh, what would happen if Blasio was in charge of the Lightning? Um, I'll answer this in two parts. One, back in 2013, when Jeff Blasio was the coach of the Grand Rapids Griffins and they won the Calder Cup, uh, they played against the Syracuse Crunch, the uh, mm -hmm. minor league affiliate of the Tampa Bay Lightning. Guess who was their coach? Uh, John Cooper. That's, <laughs> that's phenomenal, Devin. Oh, that is a great... Awesome. You just dropped the mic. I love it. <laughs> Second, um, we can't know for sure what would happen because Jeff Blaschel's never had a contending team in the NHL to coach. And John Cooper has never had a rebuilding team to coach. So in, you know, in reality, we can't just say, Oh yeah, Blaschel would suck with a, uh, a contending team because <laughs> when he's had a contending team in the <laughs> yeah. AHL, mm -hmm. he won a Calder yeah. cup with that team. And he beat John Cooper's team. For sure. Now, the first half of this question, uh, yeah. to what point do we credit Jeff Blaschel? What this says to me is that if the Red Wings suck, it's Jeff Blaschel's fault. <laughs> but if they do well, it's the players who are doing uh, well. So Jeff Blaschel is in a lose-lose situation. Yeah, I would sure. hate to have his job. Sure. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too. I think if the Red Wings are getting better, coaching has something to do with it. And if they're not progressing and they're not getting better, coaching has something to do with that too. Um, I think Jeff Blaschel has his hands all over this team, mm -hmm. uh, or his fingerprints all over this team. Um, and I think that whether they succeed or fail is as much on him as it is about the players. But I don't think it's fair to say that if they succeed, it's not because of him. If the players are getting better and they're doing what they need to do to push the team forward, the coach probably had a lot to do with it. Absolutely, man. I, I still I can't get over and I'm disappointed I didn't draw that parallel. But the Blashill, Cooper, Griffins, Crunch, yeah. head to head is one heck of a thing to bust out there, Devin. So <laughs> well done there. Well done. I'm going to use that in arguments a lot. Yeah. Year, I think. So Matthew, so uh, Matthew, your thoughts on Blashill um, and the team's success, does it hinge upon him one way or the other? Uh, I mean, first of all, I love this question. Um, you know, and that's the thing. I mean, it's a lose-lose situation for Blashill. You're looking at, I don't know, coach is only as good as the players that he has yep, yep. Um, way back with, with Vancouver, when Vigneault was praised and he won the, won the Jack Adams, it was because of a Roberto Luongo. It was not, I mean, nothing to discredit his coaching. I mean, he did do a good job leading the team, motivating and that player deployment and stuff like that. But Luongo basically was the reason he won that Jack Adams award that year. Um, going back to the Red Wings, I think, Blasio will eventually have this team going in the right direction because the fact is they have a lot of good young talent coming up. Uh, you know, Lucas Raymond is going to be coming the next couple of years. Yeah. Reisman uh, just keeps loading the team with young talent. He's going to eventually have the players that he needs to execute his system. Um, the same thing with Travis Green. Uh, he's starting to get the right mix of players now and it's the same thing with Blasio it'll start happening um connected to with Cooper and that's the same thing Cooper's got had a ridiculously good team the Are whole sure? time he's been there 
Um, yes, he grew them with the farm team. He grew he grew a whole core with them. So I mean, he kind of started was developing the young players as well, and that's what Blashill is the same thing. He's doing the same thing. He's in the farm system and moving these players up. So I mean. I think that's a great parallel to draw though. I mean, and that's, that's why I love this comment so much because yep. there it's very similar, but yep. uh, eventually Blashill, I think will uh, reap the rewards and make no mistake. You still have to be a good coach to coach a great team, oh, or a yeah. good team, yep. even with talent. Right. So I, I want to be clear for anybody watching that you guys, neither one of you are knocking Cooper for having a good team no. because yeah. he's done a hell of a job coaching that team. Anyways, you know, you go back to, of course, I'll bring it back to the wings, right? But 2002 <laughs> Red Wings with Scotty Bowman, there were very yeah. few people who would have been able to manage that locker room no, 100%. Uh, the way True. he managed it. So even though you have boatloads of talent, you can you could still screw it up pretty good. And there've been a yeah, lot of coaches over the years who've yeah. shown that Dave Lewis, <clears throat> but um, <laughs> what a call. I ever coached the Rangers back then. <laughs> <What a call. laughs> um, but regardless, I, I also love this question, Rick, uh, to be honest, I think at this point uh, you're, you're going to be stuck with Blashill's taking the credit or Blashill's taking the heat. That's what's going to happen. So if they have a good year, I fully expect Blashill to get the credit, to be honest. And he should, because my goodness, he's what, is he the third longest tenured yes, coach yeah. in the league now, which is yeah. mind boggling. Um, and he's gone through a lot and he's been patient and he deserves success. So I hope to see it, not just because that means the wings will be better, but because I think he deserves it and I'd like to see him catch a break, but time will tell. Um, great question. Great question, Rick. Absolutely. And, um, looking forward to seeing how it plays out. Up next, we've got Hal9001, who brought up our dear friend, Valtteri Filpola, who has moved on to the Swiss Hockey League. Moment of silence for Val. Thank you. Um, <laughs> there was little to no fanfare about the two-time Red Wings departure. Um, question... Hell's question is, do you think he may return potentially even a, in a scout type role, take over a Nicholas Cronwall type overseas evaluating talent, things like that? Um, is there a chance we see Philpola in the organization again? Devin, we'll start with you. I think there's definitely a chance. Um, I don't remember. This was a while ago, but I remember uh, you, Pat, calling him out as uh, somebody that you, you actually liked watching, especially back uh, mm -hmm back in his prime. Mm -hmm. um, I think he, uh, it's, 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 a, it's kind of a shame because he does get kind of uh, overlooked now because the back half of his career was definitely not as good as the front half. Right. Um, but when he was a prime player in his prime, uh, prime of his career, he's a very good player. The Rebbings probably should not have let him walk, especially considering the, what happened with the player that uh, they'd signed in his, uh, in his place. Shout out to you, Stephen Weiss. Um, uh, but yeah. oh. <laughs> it's a moment of silence for him. Still can't. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I, I've talked about this before. The, one of the things I love about the Red Wings, uh, as an organization is that the players that spend a lot of time in the organization usually find their way back in some capacity and they really take ownership of the team and they take an active role in propelling the team and the organization forward. So, Phil Pula mentioned that when he signed with the Red Wings uh, a couple of years ago, that he wanted to end his career or at least go back to where it started. So he has, you know, some sort of fond affections towards Detroit. So I would not be surprised one bit if he joins uh, the team again in some sort of scouting or advisor or whatever role. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, Matthew, your thoughts on Phil Pula. Do you see him uh, taking a front office job somewhere and especially maybe back in Detroit? Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, uh, he was a great player for a number of years in Detroit. Uh, one of those character guys, one of those guys that could play a uh, top six role and a bottom six. Um, great at face-offs, great penalty killer. Um, he's one of those players that I, I gravitate to because of that versatility that he brought. And uh, when I scout guys, I, I love players like that. And uh, that is also conducive to like that, a scouting role. So I think he could definitely become uh, a scout in the NHL somewhere advisory. Um, he's just that type of guy, type of player that would do well in that role. 
Yep. Makes sense. And even just to pile on a little bit more, I think his connection, since he's going back, obviously in the Swiss hockey league and everything else, he's going to have a chance to almost incognito be evaluating talent, if you will, right out of the gate. Um, The Red Wings could certainly take advantage of that and it would be wise if they did. So I've always been a Philpola fan, if you will, Uh, agreed the, the second half of his career was tough to watch. Uh, I was excited when they brought him in, but I mean, you know, very few players could have made a difference on the teams that he was a part of in Detroit. I think he knew his role when he came. I still don't think he played up to expectations, but we love you, Val. We love you. And uh, it'd be great if you stayed in the organization. Great question, Hal. Um, We appreciate it. So up next, and I need to stress Blake 1991. (laughs) It's Blake 1991 and Blake. I am so sorry, Blake, for calling you Billy Blake. (laughs) Seriously, I'm sorry. I don't know how I messed that up last week. And I'm glad you called me out on that. Um, So I'm serious. Anyways, um, Blake brings up, (laughs) brings up, uh, a potential. I, I really have to hold myself accountable. That's all. Um, this is like that that name game thing where you <laughs> say somebody's name five times to like get it in your head. Yeah, <laughs> I'll never forget <laughs> Blake. Never I will never forget name. you. <laughs> I like that to meet you, Blake. What do you do for work, Blake? <laughs> Uh, I'm starting to drive us off the rails. I got to get us back on. We were doing good. Um, but anyways, okay. Blake says. A healthy Dylan Larkin is potentially a 70 plus point player a year. True or false? Devin, we're starting with you. True, because it's already happened. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to say that I'm expecting that of Larkin because I, we've talked about this plenty of times already on the show. Larkin's uh, main focus at this point is to be the best possible two-way center that he can, he can be. And that does not necessarily mean that he's going to go out and light the lamp every single night. Um, That being said, yeah, if, if he has the right line mates, he's used in the right way. He stays healthy and he's not getting hit with cheap shots. Uh, He very much so has the potential and the ability to score 70 points. Like I said, he's already done it. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just a matter of whether or not um, he's going to play in a system and in a role that is conducive to him doing that. Yep. Yep. Totally agree there. I've got thoughts on that myself. Matthew, uh, your thoughts on a healthy Lark and and can he produce 70 plus points? I'd echo what Devin said. Yeah, I I definitely think he can. Uh, He's got the skill. He's got the speed. Uh, Health is going to be a huge thing. I mean, he has to stay healthy to do it, obviously. Um, Line mates also, um, where he's deployed is another thing. I mean, yep. for, you know, being deployed in the offensive zone a lot more. But like I said, like Devin said too, he has to be a, being a good two-way center as well. Yep. Um, I see him as being that 70-point player and being a two-way center because he has that talent to do so. Um, I've loved him, again, another guy the Canucks could have drafted that they never did. But <laughs> And I had an eye on him when the Canucks were in that draft as well. So sure. uh, yeah, he, he's a great, great player in the NHL and definitely can hit 70 points. That's really cool to hear your perspective on yeah. the Canucks drafting him, to be honest. Um, so for all those Larkin haters out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, wait, I haven't gone yet. <laughs> and actually i'm totally kidding because if you guys recall just a couple episodes ago i was one of larkin's biggest defenders now that said um while i echo your sentiment both of you in that he's certainly capable of putting up 70 points in a season if he's healthy i don't think he's going to do that anymore because i think he's focused more on being a two-way player and i think if you're focused more on being a two-way player um, you're just not going to have the numbers because you're back checking because you're playing a lot more defense. You're, you're in the trenches, you're winning the battles, you're doing the things you need to do so that your teammates can be open. Now, you know, he'll have a lot of assists as well, and he's certainly yeah. not going to lose his scoring touch. He's a very, very capable center. Um, and he's, uh, he's a leader on the team and there's no reason why, like if he did it, I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't think he's going to, because I think it's been clear. Not only has he been focusing on his two way game, but it's also kind of been clear that he's probably going to be on the second line. So he's not going to be getting quite as much um, time as he would if he were on the first line. So, um, you know, a lot of thoughts there, but while he's capable, 
Um, I just think he's focusing a little too much, not, not too much, but I think the focus on his two way ability um, will win him a Selkie, but not this year necessarily. <laughs> we'll win him a Selkie eventually, not but not. I don't think <laughs> we will see uh, 70 points, but uh, Blake, very good question. <laughs> <laughs> and um, appreciate you watching and commenting. Thank you. And sincere apologies. That won't happen again. Um, all right. So those are our comments and, and we wanted to, we're going to finish with, if you remember a uh, segment a few weeks ago with Rachel, explain yourself right now. <laughs> um, we've got a couple of people who we want to do some talking. So Devin, you missed out last week. <laughs> I did. Because we had what I think might be my favorite question we've ever gotten on this show, which is, is Iserman a better GM than a player? And not only did you already get to see all of our answers, but you got to see all the comments and boy, did it get some <laughs> comments. And I love it, by the way, we love it. But Devin, this is your chance to get out those thoughts that I know you have on this question. So I ask you to explain yourself right now. Is Iserman a better GM than player? I do want to start by saying shout out to this question. Holy cow. Um, <laughs> I think as it stands right now, uh, you know, we're recording here on September 3rd, 2021. Uh, all you have to do is lay out Eisenman's resume and it will tell you as a resume, as a player and as a GM, I should say. Um, and it will tell you that the resume as a player is a lot longer than his yeah. resume as a GM. Um, he won three Stanley cups as a player and as a captain, um, he was a hundred plus point player as a, uh, as a, uh, as a player, um, he won individual awards as a player. Um, he, when you talk about Red Wings greats, you can talk about him in the same breath as Gordie Howe. And that is not a small Ooh. feat. Um, it, even even expanding beyond the scope of just the Red Wings, Eisenman is genuinely one of the best players to ever play the game. Sure. It's okay. simple as that. Um, so then to look over and look at him as a GM, I think, you know, as of today, if you will ask anybody who follows the NHL, I think they'll tell you that, yes, I, Steve Eisenman is a great general manager, knows what he's doing. All you have to do is look at the Tampa Bay Lightning and know that this guy knows how to form a plan and knows how to build a team. Um, but... While he built those teams that just won back-to-back -back Stanley Cups, they didn't do it on his watch. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. built 90% of that team. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It was on Julian Brisebois to build the other 10%, and that is what won the Stanley Cup. Yeah. Um, it's just I, I to to this point, yes, I think <laughs> I, I think there's a very real chance that uh, when Eisenman decides to hang him up for good and calls it calls it a career as a general manager. I think that this would be a fantastic topic to write about, to debate, to discuss. Uh, let's talk about this again in 10, 15 years, okay? Because I think <laughs> that this, this conversation will be a lot more even. This debate will be a lot more uh, interesting. But as it stands right now, uh, Eisenman built 90% of a Stanley Cup contender as a general manager, and he's He's just starting and putting a rebuilding team in the right direction. He hasn't done anything with this team yet. He's only put them in the right direction. Um, anybody who's getting a bit, bit more excited than that, you might be jumping the horse a little bit. Mm. It's good to be excited, but we haven't, we're still in the mess right now. Yeah. Um, but as a player, I mean, you can, I already, I already detailed it. He's got awards up the wazoo. Mm -hmm. um, he's one of the best players to ever do it. We can't say that as a general manager quite yet. So I'd like your 10 to 15 years. I would say once Eisenman retires as a GM, it'll be no contest because the Red Wings will have more cups than the Canadians. So uh, <laughs> I got jokes. I got jokes. <laughs> Melissa, um, if you're watching, it's gonna happen. <laughs> oh, good stuff. I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. Um, even I couldn't say that with a straight oh, face. So, but, so really good stuff, Devin. Thanks. I'm glad you got that off your chest. I felt bad that we were talking about it, but I couldn't even wait a week. I couldn't wait a week <laughs> to put it on there. We had to. <laughs> um, so good stuff. And we are going to end our show. Matthew, you're going to have the final uh, word on your own segment of explain yourself right now. <laughs> because one, I figured since you're the producer, if you don't like your own answer, you can just cut it right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, you had the last time we were recording, 
we were talking about the Red Wings potentially offering Elias Peterson uh, an offer sheet. And I thought I heard some weird grinding in the background. Turned out it was you grinding your teeth. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but since we have you and we really appreciate you joining us today, I am curious for your thoughts on our discussion or even just in general, anyone offering Elias Peterson an offer sheet. So explain yourself right now. <laughs> First of all, don't do it. Um, that's my that's my message to every GM in the NHL right now. Don't do it. Um, because the Canucks are going to match it um, for one. It doesn't matter what money it is. They're going to match it. Yep. Uh, Jim Benning already said anyone we're matching. It doesn't matter. Um, having said that, I don't like offer sheets because of the fact that you're forced into that contract. Mm hmm. It's not controlled by you anymore. You're putting, you know, whatever team's going to have to put a 10 plus million offer sheet on the table to even make the Canucks think twice. Um, if it's a seven, eight million, Canucks will be like, done, matched, done, we're done. Yeah. Um, it has to be 10 plus million for it to be something that they'll maybe hesitate a bit. Sure. I still don't think they will hesitate. They'll just match it. Pedersen's just too good of a player, too important to the Canucks core to say we'll take draft picks sure yeah um again yeah the draft picks are going to be first round picks a bunch of them for the next few years but it depends on the team that you're getting them from yeah. if yep. they're later round picks you're not yeah. getting a Pedersen yeah. at 20 plus you're at yeah, now if they were lottery picks another story but that's an unknown. You have yep. Pedersen now. He's a known entity for the Canucks. You keep him. And so any team thinking, oh, we're going to get Pedersen, we're going to do an offer sheet, not going to happen. So that's my thoughts. I'm not saying that the Red Wings aren't a team that could do it. Um, but like to your points last week, it's not something Eisenman should be entertaining. Yep. Um, looking at the draft picks that he's going to have yep. in the next few drafts, the Red Wings are still going to be in that top 10 um, lottery pick territory. Is it worth giving up that many, those first round picks for Pedersen? Um, from the Red Wings standpoint, I don't think it is um, the best decision. So, yep, makes and, sense. And yeah, Devin, go ahead. And I just want to throw it out there too. Let's look at what's happening right now with Montreal and Carolina, where yeah. Montreal offer sheeted uh, Sebastian Ajo. Um, Obviously, we know what happened there. <laughs> Carolina ended up matching it. And then what did Carolina do? They went out and offered she had Yespari uh, Kakakunami, issued the exact same statement about yeah. it, <laughs> uh, is literally a one-year deal designed just to be vengeance. Like, it's, yeah. it's a spiteful, literal, uh, retaliatory move. Yeah. And if you offer she a player like Pedersen, you open yourself up to deal with that. For yeah. sure. Hey, Devin, what was that signing bonus? For uh, twenty dollars. <laughs> Wait, what's 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 Sebastian Ajo's number? Twenty. <laughs> I am so sorry, but go. expert it's, troll level right yeah. not, there. Not too many uh, signing <laughs> NHL signing bonuses that I could pay. Yeah. <laughs> expert expert troll level right and there. You, just, have, you have to tip your just cap. one yeah. one extra thing to it. Benning would definitely be eventual GM if yeah, someone did yeah. that to him. Just well, saying, he already did it with the backest one. Yeah, sure. Or the, he didn't do it. He, he got it done back to him um, when he operated backest way back when. So, sure. well, it's not something that he probably wants to open himself up to. You having said that now really wants me to see that. So, <laughs> <laughs> little, little soap opera drama taking place in the NHL. Um, <laughs> Good stuff. Well, Matthew, thanks for thanks for the insight on that, too. I think we all kind of agreed last week, too. Like, it, it's fun to daydream. But to your point, and I think we all said it, we know they're going to match. Everybody knows they're going to match. So why would you put yourself in that position? But um, anyways, that is our show. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Devin, as always, um, loving the hat by the way. I uh, hope your time in the Pacific Northwest last week was, was good. And um, only other thing I have to say before we leave is go Cyclones. Go Cyclones. Um, looking forward to the football season kicking off uh, as of taping tomorrow, or at least for what I'm following. And um, 
biggest year in Iowa State football history. So let's see how it goes. That's our show. Like us, comment, subscribe, uh, tweet at us at THW Grindline. We will answer your comment on air as you've seen. We love interacting with you. Thanks for watching, and we will see you again next time. Go Broncos.